I can remember writing shortly after Trump was elected. He has to placate his base and he has to placate the markets. And their interests are mutually exclusive. This is a time where small localized individuals have far greater power than those at the center. My freshman class this spring, they do not see 2018 the same way investors see 2018. There is no question in their mind that the peak is behind us. Now the peak in what for them? The peak in confidence, their confidence, the confidence of America at large. They saw something 2014, 2015. When somebody picks up the Wall Street Journal, the Financial Times, to step back and say, as you're reading these headlines, why are they here? Why are these on the front page? And they're on the front page always to confirm the bias of the reader. The front page is telling you this is the consensus view. The nationalist Nissan leadership base said, we are not going to become fully integrated into a global organization. That nationalistic opposition to globalism put Ghosn very vulnerable. The American dream for, for most Americans has become unachievable. And so that which is not given will be taken. I'm about to sit down for a long overdue chat with a man who probably makes me question things I read and think about more than just about anybody else. That's Peter Atwater. There's so much I want to talk to him about, confidence, mood, left versus right, and of course Tesla. I can't leave that one alone, uh, and the trade wars. So let's go and see what Peter has to say. Peter Atwater, welcome back to Real Vision. Thank you, Grant. You know, we've been trying to do this for a while. We, we, we kind of finally got our diaries synced, uh, but you know, now we're here. It just feels like there's nothing to talk about. There isn't. I mean, I think we just call it a day. And, what, are we gonna, what the hell are we going to talk about? You know, our first conversation, which was you know, over two years ago now, was one of my favorite interviews I've done. It's just talking about mood and confidence and all the signals there. And since we had that conversation, I've recalled that over and over in my mind. And you've really helped me see what's going on through a completely different prism. So I thank you for that, no, first thank of you. all. And then there's just so much of it. Once, you, once you're awake to it, everything has an ulterior message and sends signals. So, I mean, there's a ton of stuff I want to talk to you about, but I, I guess I'm going to start by throwing it over to you. What do you think is the most important indicator that you're seeing right now? So the things that I'm focused on right now are iconic people, images, characters, we, we've transcended reality to, <laughs> that the truth? to a point where levers that are being pulled all relate to very large, oversized symbols. So you, 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 you've joked about with me about the pandas, but you know, China's decision to recall the pandas from the San Diego Zoo, I think, is an enormous powerful message that people are completely ignoring because it seems you know cute and silly yeah. it's like no they're saying we're retrenching and if you don't understand that symbol then you are going to be completely trampled by what's coming after this yeah because we're we're sending you your sort of billboard size messages that you're ignoring but I mean, people look at that and they kind of just see it as a I guess in panda parlance, a tit tit for tat tat. I don't know if, it, if that's, I don't know what the pandas are called, but, but it, it, everything that's happening feels like it's, uh, it's just a, well, you do that, we're gonna do this. Yeah. But if you look beneath the surface, it, it's steadily escalating. And, it, and it, people, as you said, won't believe that the pandas is actually a major escalation of this, but, but it is. It is. And I think it, a lot of the reason we are missing all of this is that it's very uncomfortable to take something that is as psych psychologically distant as a trade war and believe that that could possibly be true. Yeah. It's, it's the difference between talking about cancer as a broad term and then receiving a diagnosis that says, you have lung cancer. Right. And so it's gonna take something, and I don't know what the precipitating event is, to bring this foreign kind of thing that's out there that crystallizes in our mind, and we go, oh shit, this is real. Yeah. So, so the, let's talk about the trade. Let's stay on the trade war for now, because 
the signs that you're seeing from the Chinese side, the signs that are very clearly and, and deliberately being sent by the Trump administration, you know, the, the Huawei thing is, is perhaps the one to talk about first and foremost. But what do you see? How are you seeing this play out through the media, through those iconic images? So Huawei is a, is a wonderful, iconic example. So it is to China what Apple is to us. So I think it's only a matter of time before something is aimed at Apple, because we're, we're now going after the, the iconic American industry that has been at the center point of this recovery. And so we're going to, we, the Chinese government, are going to do something to take a bite out of that apple. The challenge, as we're seeing with Huawei and others, is the egg is so scrambled that when you try to separate yolk and white, to say this Chinese symbol, this American symbol, you end up with, a, with ripples through this yeah. scrambled supply chain that has enormous unintended consequences. And so as, as much as leaders want to send these symbolic messages over the bow, they're, they're ignoring either deliberately or just out of ignorance how deep the, the connections are and the odd pivot points that go along with that. But, but is it ignorance? Because that's the Huawei thing, the day it happened, which is, as we record this, just a couple of days ago, you know, I, remember, I woke up, read that, and was like, wow, this is, this is a major escalation. Uh, and then the very next day, it gets walked back again. Right. Because it, now is, is that ignorance, which terrifies me, or was that a deliberate strategy that we're going to do this and then we're going to walk back just to show you where we might go with it? But you can't keep walking things back. No, I, exactly right. So, so you may be able to do that once or twice, but eventually you, you have a cascade. You know, the, the, it begins to take on a momentum of its own. You're, I think you've seen a lot of that in the, in the agricultural space where what felt like symbols have all of a sudden created real havoc. And so you, you can't walk it back. The, yeah. the, the damage has been done. So what, what do you look, when, you, when you try and game this, this trade war, what are you looking for? What are you looking for as a, as a potential tipping point that means, okay, we've gone too far. This is no longer posturing. This is now going to become a, a big problem for markets. So what I'm looking for is the crowd to stop coming up with placating narratives that go along yeah. with each of these, these actions. And so, you know, every day I'm, I'm watching to see the causation arguments that are out there. The market fell because, the market rose because. And, and it's remarkable how we've been able on down days to come up with yes, but. Yeah. And so there comes a point where the crowd says, there is no but. And so what I'm watching very closely is how close have we come to the cliff where we just keep going? And I think we're, I think we're getting precariously close. Yeah, I mean, this, this, this narrative on the markets about Trump saying, we're gonna stick another 25% on $200 billion, and then in the next day, the tweet about things are going great, I've got a great relationship. I mean, that, I'm astounded by how long that seems to have worked and seems to have held the market together. Maybe it isn't that holding the market together. I don't know, because it feels to me like we should have reached that point you're talking about long ago. So I, I can remember writing shortly after Trump was elected that he is like a, a soccer player who wears one jersey, runs midfield to changes the jersey to play for the other side. And, and what I mean by that is he has to placate his base and he has to placate the markets. And their interests are mutually exclusive. Yes, I mean, the, the, the Venn diagram doesn't overlap. Yeah. And so this has been going on for you know, the entire term. It, it, it actually took place the night he was elected, and the futures cascaded, yep. and then people were like, oh, no, he's not going to be as bad as that. And then you had the rally through the, the tax incentives. And so he is playing a very challenging game where the two ends are in absolute opposition. You know, globalization and integrated supply chains 
is anathema to those who are looking for a wall, whether in physical or emotional form. But he's, I mean, he's, you write all the time about confidence and, and the importance of confidence in investor psychology, the markets themselves. Trump has, has been successful in many avenues that he's kind of charged down. Does that confidence on a, on a, on a human level, boiling it down to him only, is that to our detriment eventually that he has been buoyed with more and more confidence and so he's becoming more and more uh, or using brinkmanship more and more because he feels imbued with with absolute confidence oh absolutely and you and you see that in in the relationship between the decisions he makes when his approval ratings are high yeah. versus when they're low and so and not uncommon that you you with leaders of that personality type they become very emboldened by their approval ratings. What's, what's interesting about Trump is that other leaders have chosen those high approval ratings to, to undertake efforts that are um, cross the aisle. Yeah. So we're going we're to do something that is going to stretch my base a little bit, but is good going forward, or I believe it to be good. It's, it, there's a generous quality. What you see with with the president is the antithesis of that. This is this is when he is very vindictive and tries very hard to, you know, truly press settle scores. Yeah, yeah, settle settle the score. Um, and that's that's something that you see based on personality. Um, you know, by example, and a, and a terrible example and an extreme example is. You know, what was going on when oil prices peaked last year and the Khashoggi killing. That, that to me, is a, is a classic, you know, revenge-filled moment of peak confidence. Yeah. Let's switch, switch away from the president to the Fed, because there's another a group which have a, a, a tremendous effect on the markets. I never associate the word confidence with the Fed, just more, it's more hubris to me. I, I don't know that they're confident. I think they believe, they truly believe that they have all the answers. What did you make of... Powell's flip-flop. I, I, you know, I ask as many people as I can this because I'm still trying to figure it out. I think that they, as a group, are extremely underconfident. I think that the, the Fed, as an institution, peaked, whether it was with Greenspan or slightly thereafter. And I say that because in the Greenspan era, no one knew the names of the regional Fed governors. Right, so true. There was one voice. And, and that singular voice speaks to the confidence inside and outside of the Fed. Today, you can, you can name all of the yeah. regional districts who, they, who they're headed by. And so you have this Medusa-like organization that is trying to be all things to all people. And that's a terrible place for the Fed to be at this yeah. point. But, but is, is, is it a coordinated attempt to spread as many, let's, let's throw a whole bunch of stuff at the wall and see what sticks, see what, what resonates, or is it every man for himself and I'm going to get out and say what I think? It's and, every man for himself. Really? That's interesting. Oh, yeah. No, you, you, you have seen power shift from the center to the region. And, and candidly, you're seeing that in lots of other ways as well today. You know, if, if somebody said, I want to run for president or be governor or be city mayor, I, I've said to my students, this, this is a time where small localized individuals have far greater power than those at the center. Well, Mayor Pete is the perfect exactly. example. Of this, I was right? about to say, he, is, he embodies that. I mean, the, the, this, is a, this is a time when grassroots leaders are going to come to the fore in good ways and bad ways. But you know, I think that you're, you're seeing the rise of local leadership today and it's being mirrored in, at the Fed. You mentioned your students. You know, when, you, when, you're trying to, when you're trying to teach kids about this stuff, uh, and realistically, the only knowledge they have of the world has been since we went through the looking glass. How, how, do, you, how do you try and teach them about how the world used to be and how it's always run when they live in this kind of strange construct that we've built around ourselves? So one of the fabulous parts about teaching college freshmen, it'd be even better with middle school students, right. is they feel it unconsciously. They sense 
all of the uncertainty. Uh, my freshman class this spring said the peak was really three years ago. And they could define it in terms of the music that they were listening to, what they believed to be true, that there was a, there, that they do not see 2018 the same way investors see 2018. It's, it, there is no question in their mind that the peak is behind us. Now the peak in what for them? The peak in confidence, their confidence, the confidence of America at large. They saw something 2014, 2015. But it was a prior to the election. Prior to the election. That's interesting. And so to talk about the election with them, it makes perfect sense to them that Americans would, Americans who feel worse would be favorable towards Trump versus Clinton. So th it, it feels very right to them that we've, we've evolved the way we have, given that confidence peaked you know, sometime before. So are we, I mean, by immersing ourselves in markets as we've done, are we doing ourselves a, a massive disservice right now in trying to figure out what's going to happen next? Yeah, I think that the markets have been very late to the table here. Yeah, it seems to be. So whether you look at auto sales, you look at unicorns, I mean, they, there are lots of indicators that suggest that the peak was behind us. And even from my perspective, even vis-a-vis -vis the markets, I would say that the, the financial market peak was January 2018, when Bitcoin yep. went you know, asymptotic. What it is, what it embodies, I talk about iconic institution, but, but Bitcoin, for me, the, the peak of that bubble was the peak in our willingness to embrace transformative change at such an extreme that you know, it, this time was definitely going to be different, and grandma was in on it. Yeah. Well, look, when you, when you talk to people about this, um, and, you know, I, I read every single piece you put out because it, it always just makes me think about this stuff, and sometimes I'll read a, a, a newspaper article and I won't think twice about it, and then you'll, it'll appear in your Friday note, and I'll go, damn, yeah, I didn't think about that. H how do you try and frame this stuff? Because, it, you know, I know you see something behind every headline. And I'm trying to learn how to do that. And it's, you know, between you and Ben Hunt, it's, it's an ongoing, uh, ongoing class that I'm taking. But you know, can, you, can you help people understand how to read these things in the correct way and how to kind of open your mind to, to what the message really is behind them? So I think that when somebody picks up the Wall Street Journal, the Financial Times, whatever they do, and you can do it online, the, the, the online curating works in the same way, is to step back and say, as you're reading these headlines, why are they here? Why are these on the front page? And they're on the front page always to confirm the bias of the reader. It is very, very rare that you'll see on the cover of the Journal, the Financial Times, the New York Times, something that is challenging, you know, that's going to yeah. cause the crowd to to step back. This is, they, what they want is for you to start reading and keep reading from there. Yep. So the, the front page is telling you this is the consensus view. And so often you, you will have seen a story that a week ago was on page B18, moved to the front page of the B section to move finally to the front page of the front section. Yeah. And so that migration is telling you that the story has legs, that it sticks, and the momentum is now peaking. I think it's important to recognize that front page acreage is incredibly expensive. So nothing can last there. It, it hits and goes. So this is, this is the editors capitalizing on the frenzy, and once it's there, it's done. So let me give you a real life example from Sunday's New York Times. What is front and center on the top of the New York Times? A story about the financial distress of people who bought taxi medallions at the top. Right. And you dig in and there's this beautiful picture of an asymptotic peak in medallion prices that have collapsed. And so you, you couple that and you say, wow. So here on the one hand, we have taxi drivers who are despondent and you have Uber going public. 
what a wonderful contrast in, in mood, the, the ebullience, you know, albeit stale, of an organization like Uber and a traditional taxi cab business that is all but yeah. bankrupt. So, so how, but how do investors learn to step away from that, recognize these things for what they are? And, you know, we, we, we talk a lot on Real Vision about being a contrarian, and, and there's, there's, a, there's a way to look at that in, in the broad spectrum of things. But, but to try and force yourself to think like one when you read the news, which, which it seems is what is required, you don't need to act on necessarily, but you have to teach yourself to be a contrarian. Yeah. You know, ben, ben Hunt says, why am I reading this and why now? Mm -hmm. um, which is, you know, is paraphrasing exactly. exactly the way you talk about it. So, and that's something that I've really tried to do in every headline. How do people you know, almost train themselves to, to be able to read this differently and then either take action over it or, or at least open their kind of mental pathways to take an action that goes against the crowd completely? It's a hard thing to do. It's an incredibly hard thing to do. And it's, it's lonely, so that makes it difficult. It is inherently in conflict with what the crowd is doing. And it's far easier for us to accept the, the opinion and ideas of a crowd than it is for us to come up with our own. I think that for most investors, being a contrarian is, is all but an impossibility. But at the same time, what, what contrarian thinking does is it enables you to, to look at things from a risk perspective yeah. and to say, yes, it, yes, prices could get far worse here at the low. But as an entry point over the next month, I'm, I'm not gonna pick the low, but the low is in this neighborhood. And if I'm wrong, it's because bad went to terrible. Yeah. Not great went to good, which is when most investors start to look at things. They, they buy the dip. It's like, no, 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 don't, don't that, that train left. This, this is, they're truly buying things that are reviled, deeply discounted in price, and are very lonely. You know, buying ag, you know, soybeans a week ago, you know, when, when every headline from deer to crop plantings is, is telling you it's only going to get worse. So, so let, let's, there's, there's so many things, I'm going to be a bit scattergun with this, but let, let's talk about um, buybacks, because this is something that you've You've written a lot about this. Uh, what does this mean, this massive, massive move? I saw a, a, an amazing stat the other day, and I'm, I'm, I may get my numbers wrong, but it was saying that the S&P would have been 19% lower if it hadn't been for stock buybacks. What, what's the signal there? So a couple of things about the buybacks. If you think about companies who started to buy when prices were lower, they bought few shares then a larger volume of shares. And so you started to see as earnings were rising, share buybacks were rising. And so what you've had is a buying more at higher prices. The, the classic, don't do this, you know, <laughs> right. what, what, what Graham and Buffett say you, just, you should never do. But, but that is inherently what we do. And in this cycle, it's what corporations have done to you know, record, record excess. And the challenge with that, if you're a corporation, if you're the CFO or the CEO, is that in the back of your mind, there's an average cost. Yeah, yeah. way and, back. And your average cost is rising and rising and rising and rising. And so you have cost basis bias, which says if prices start to fall, I've got to keep buying. Yeah. And the, the danger with that is that it becomes existential, that now I have no choice but to buy because I am the bid. Yeah. And what's been interesting of late is I think investors are now front-running corporate bidding during the blackout period. And, and example du jour to me was Lowe's this morning where the stock plummeted and then it was, you know, a bungee jump kind of, a, of an ascent. And you can imagine in the minds of, of some investors, traders thinking, you know, Lowe's can't buy now, but they'll be back next week. Yeah. Yep. And so I'm going to be lifted out of this. 
And that's a really telling aspect of the, of the behavior that we, we can now game corporations because we know they're coming. But, but that, I mean, that's really dangerous for markets, right? It's terribly really dangerous. dangerous. I mean, and, and it's amazing how you, know, you started talking about this, these no skid marks events, like the, um, Toys R Us is the one that jumps immediately to mind, where these bonds are trading, you know, money good, and, and then and, suddenly yeah. they're bankrupt. And that just tells you how little people are looking at, at and they're, or certainly are worrying about deterioration in credit quality and stuff. But it's amazing to me how quickly the market, whether it's passive algos or not, I don't know, has figured this out. Uh, and, and when we get these big downdrafts on specific missed earnings and slash guidance, I mean, that, those are the two, you know, the, the classic double that you don't want in your, in your announcement. And already the market's figured out that's potentially a buying event. Is that how it goes? I, I think that there's a lot of that. Um, but I, I think we, we, you know, whether the algos have picked it up or whether we've, we've psychologically, the crowd now knows that you know, once the blackout periods end, corporations will be back because they have to be. Yeah. It's, you know, we're, we're late in the cycle, so in order to boost EPS, it's about some growth at the top line, but that denominator has got to shrink. And, and it gets really interesting in the context of Uber. So the, the other day, there was a fabulous chart showing the um, cost basis of different investors in Uber. And I think it's really significant that late in the, in the private rounds, who shows up but SoftBank and, and Sabek, the, the Saudi kingdom. So now you have investors you talk about existential risk. You know, they can't afford for Uber to trade below their cost basis because that then draws into question so much. So the first time they'll buy the dip. And I think, you know, my sense is that's probably what happened, you know, last week, the week before. But I think that as, as we look at symbols and organizations that are of st strategic global importance, I'm watching Uber because it has huge political risk now embedded in it. If, if SoftBank and the, the Sabic start to lose money, that, that has implications through to governments around the world. Well, where does SoftBank fit into this narrative? Because you know, I've looked at it and shaken my head for a long time now. I, 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 I've never believed the hype. I just, there's something about it that just doesn't smell right to me. Are they an integral part of this? Yes. I think they, I, I, I've said uh, my associate son is, is the, the Carlos Ghosn of finance today. <laughs> you know, he has created a financial alliance that links Silicon Valley and the kingdom. I call it, you know, Silicon Arabia, Saudi America, whatever you right. want, you know. But he is at the center point of political, economic, financial ties that go now globally in the same way Ghosn was. And, and I don't, again, I don't think folks truly appreciate the symbolism. I mean, Ghosn is in jail yeah. purely for symbolic reasons. But I mean, explain that, because there will be people that that, 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 that story so, did amazingly go under the radar. Yeah, so, so no question he spent foolishly and, and you know, the, the things that they've uncovered would naturally have been uncovered. We'll get on to car CEO spending yeah. foolishly in a minute. But he was defrocked because the, the nationalist Nissan leadership base said, we are not going to become fully integrated into a global organization. That, that nationalistic opposition to globalism put Ghosn very vulnerable. And it was just a matter of, you know, what can we find 
to upend this and and remarkably easy. Yeah. I mean, right. it didn't take much and it and the consequences have been perilous beyond what you would normally expect if confidence was rising. You know, this is uh, he should be out on bail somewhere. And, and, and right. no, he's so so we're we're imprisoning the symbols here. That's telling us that there is enough nationalistic groundswell in in Japan, I would say you sense the same thing in, in Europe, that the days of integrated behavior are coming to an end. We are, you know, we are tribing, we're yeah. you know, balkanizing the, the, the global economy. And he's, he was the poster child for integration. And I see a very similar potential outcome on the soft bank front. Because what you have in SoftBank is the Mitsubishi, Nissan, Renault. Yeah. It's, it's the same, same concept, same thesis, uh, now likely to be viewed same cancer applied to a different patient. So, so how important is it that, that in the last month we've seen the stories about the, the 100 billion IPO of, of the Vision Fund? How important is that as a, as a potential catalyst for this change? I think it's an extraordinary expression of the overconfidence that exists inside of SoftBank. Right. Uh, but, but nothing wider than that? It's just it's a purely SoftBank specific? So I again associate that to say if SoftBank is a symbol, you know, maybe the symbol of the integrated capital flows into high tech, into disruptive technology, into this this time is different technology space, that IPO of the Vision Fund says to me, you know, we're ringing the bell. It's funny, isn't it? The bell, it felt like Uber and Lyft were going to be the bell. And then you have the Vision. Everyone seems to be one-upping. I mean, the bell's out there somewhere. Yeah. Uh, and as soon as I saw that Vision Fund headline, I was like, this is... But, but what, what that Vision Fund generated was skepticism. Yeah. And that is very, very different from what I think we would have seen 18 months yep. ago. So, so going, just going back to going uh, briefly, how important is it that he was a foreigner? Oh, it made him simple to oust. So, so we, again, we will easily gleefully upend foreign leaders. Yeah. Um, you saw the same thing in Barclays. When Barclays hit the skid, what, and what do they replace him with? You know, Diamond was replaced with a very traditional nationalistic leader. Um, I, I would say it's what makes Jess Staley extremely vulnerable today. He is not British. He is not inside the tent. It has nothing to do with ability, just, you know, we, we will want leaders who look, speak, act like us, however we define the us. Yeah, that's the, that's your me you know, here, me now. here now. Yeah, exactly right. So look, I, I've 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 done I think a fantastic job of, of leaving this question until we got this. But you you started us down the automaker thing, so I have to, I have to bring the conversation around to Tesla because so much of what you talk about is wrapped up in the stock, and and I, I get criticised all the time for being fixated with it, and I make no apologies for that. I am utterly fixated with the story because I think it is it's way bigger than Tesla. It's not mm -hmm. about making a few dollars off a short position. It's nothing to do with that to me. This is the crystallization of everything you speak about, of everything Ben Hunt speaks about, of everything I've watched build up over the years. It is, uh, you know, it's, it's malinvestment. It is low cost of capital. It is reaching for yield. It is dreaming. It's eco-culture. It's the cult of celebrity. It's everything wrapped up into one stock. And you can now finally see this thing unraveling in real time, it seems. So, I mean, broad question, how important is Tesla to the, to the whole market narrative? And, and then from there, what's your take on it? Because I'm fascinated. It's hugely important. Um, and it's hugely important because of the, the personality type that is Elon Musk. Uh, you know, I, I joke often, you know, he, he like, others that are out there is a is often analogized to to Harold Hill the right. music man yeah. you know promising boldly 
And, and I think of that in the context of more specifically sort of the circus barker. And I, you know, people will be offended by the analogy, but if you think about a circus barker, you know, the first time the, the circus comes to town, the, the lady has two heads and everybody goes. And then the next year when the circus comes back, she's got to have three heads. Because otherwise you've seen it. Otherwise yeah. you've seen yeah. it. And then the, the three heads have to become five, become eight. But eventually when you get to 10 heads, the crowd's like, no, right. no, I just, I... It's like six minute abs, right? yeah. seven yeah. is fine. Yeah. It, it just becomes so extreme as to be disbelieved. And, and you know, I believe that that's the nature of the con. Yeah. They become self-asphyxiating. That in order to perpetuate it, you have to go to such great lengths that it, it finally collapses on its weight. And I think that you've seen that with Musk in all of the, the pivots. You know, it, this week it's, you know, it's cars. Next week it's cars with solar panels on the top. Then it's cars that have this. And now we're talking about insurance. And so the, to me, Tesla is now the ten-headed lady. Right. And it become, it's become so extreme to, as to be disbelieved. Now, having said that, I think in the last week, you've seen a, a capitulation that we, we no longer believe that. We accept that it's a 10 hit lady. And so you've got these calls of, you know, Thirty dollars, ten dollars. You know, how low can you go? I mean, so you, people are desperate to get the lowest right. estimate. Now, so, which is amazing. so it's 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 the same thing you see at the top, where you know, a hundred dollar target becomes two hundred dollar, becomes five hundred dollar. So we're we're seeing that in a very short run. So I would say to anybody listening to this, you know, in late May, early June, this is this is not the time that I would be eager to get in on Tesla. Yeah. I think Tesla is a, a goose egg at the end, but. We too too many people have bought into the into the narrative that it's suspicious. So the potential is some sort of a bounce. Somebody makes noises about being interested in it. Yeah, you know, there 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 almost anything at this point could levitate it. You know, some some meaningful percentage. But it's significant because it's far more substantial than Theranos was. Theranos to me, Elizabeth Holmes stands out to me as the, the subprime of circus barkers. Right. That <laughs> you know, she was too extreme, too quickly, the, the veneer wasn't deep at all. You know, Tesla makes real cars. Yeah. So, so that gives him something to, to show people yeah. this is what we do. And at the same time, you have something like SpaceX, which is demonstrating tremendous competence in what it does. So, so there's some s substantial form to Tesla ignoring the, fin the financial condition. And, and so that, that adds psychologically some strength to its, its viability. But... We've moved from Theranos and Shkreli to, to something that is more real. So I, I think of Tesla as the sort of the alt A of this, right. this cycle, that there is still nothing there and it will be eviscerated as confidence falls. The, the broader danger are companies that have perceived real business models, Uber, yep. Airbnb, Amazon. And I think that the, the challenge for all of them is, as, as scrutiny intens intensifies, we work. Yeah. You know, what, what, what are they? They're, they're logistics companies. So how do you value a highly leveraged, highly growing logistics company that, that in many ways has no, no real assets? It's, its balance sheet is, is goodwill, intangible. Its balance sheet is the network effect. Yeah, for sure. The same thing with Facebook. Yeah. So, so I mean, as night follows day, does a return to valuations mattering follow the destruction of confidence? Yes. So scrutiny and confidence are, you know, they run in opposition. Yeah. So as confidence falls, the intensity of the scrutiny is going to rise. And 
we, we start to look for things under the rocks, not buried treasure, but worms and slugs and, and things that, that then support the narrative that this is a discredited organization. Those that are most fragile, like a Theranos, will fall very quickly. But there is no, no question in my mind that the, the cycle has changed to, again, looking, questioning, is, is this real? One of the, the most important elements to me of, of Uber from a narrative perspective was growth is not enough. Yeah. There need to be earnings. So that, again, speaks to a lower level of confidence. But, that, but I mean, as soon as, God forbid, earnings start to matter again, I mean, that, that in itself could cause all kinds of things. Sure. Uh, and is, I mean, is that inevitable now that, that we're just, we're on a path to that? Because it, if you believe in cyclicality, which I do, then, then we kind of need to go back to something real and, and valuing real earnings is a decent way to, to clear away any kind of puffy valuations that might be out there. Yeah, so, so let's look at the, the inputs to, to valuation, to earnings and how stretched all of the inputs are. This isn't a case where one metric has been stretched. Everything has. We have started at the bottom. You know, tax rates that corporations yeah. are paying, interest expense that corporations are paying, you know, the, the operating margins based on you know, global manufacturing and the ability to outsource to the, the cheapest location. So the issue, I think, from a valuation perspective is that we've, we've taken this accordion and we've stretched every variable to its extreme. So that you know, when the accordion starts to come in, you'll see demands for higher tax rates at the same time interest rates are rising, at the same time companies are having to on-source. So, so the potential for corporations is sort of this, this um, crisis in parallel that all of the levers that they've pulled, you know, I can't buy back my shares. Yep. So, so it all starts to hit at once. And you know that, that the earnings models that exist today, nobody has taken all of the levers. No, but, but this is, you know, like WeWork's community adjusted EBITDA. Yeah. But, but they, they got away with that, right? They, sure. they got away with it. Now, is, is that another sign of confidence and and, and how do we try and figure out when that is going to change? I mean, I saw my first article that kind of made a joke about community-adjusted EBITDA yes. recently. Now, is, yes. is that the first That's, chip in that? Those, those are the signs that we've, we're no longer tolerating the ridiculous. Right. You know, I, if, if somebody asked me to write a book on the last couple of years, it would be called Gullible's Travels <laughs> because investors have been completely smitten by the bells and whistles and the, the sideshow barkers and all of the, the razzle-dazzle. How important is it that this hasn't happened yet? How, how have we managed to avoid this for so long? And why do you feel like we may finally be at the point where all this is going to kind of matter? So I think if you go back to a peak in 2015, what has prolonged this? Well, the tax, the, first the promise of the tax Yep. cuts. And again, folks don't realize that the, the, um, when the legislation was finally approved and signed, that, that was the top. Yeah. Uh, that was co coincided with Bitcoin and people eating Tide Pods. So you had, you had that extreme in confidence, but it was sustained by financial engineering. And, and investors in the cycle have fully embraced whatever financial engineering they can. After the tax code, it's been stock buybacks and the fangs. And so you've had more financial engineering, but more importantly, you've had narrowing. So we, we went from embracing a diverse portfolio to a series of, of acronyms. And even that has narrowed. Yeah. You know, we now have the, the MAGA stocks, you know, Microsoft, App, Apple, Google, See, Amazon. I, 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 honestly, I, I honestly believe people are coming up with cute acronyms now and then shoving stocks in there, to fit, and, but it's and, working. And, but from experience, the cuter the acronym, the m more painful the end. 
Right. right. So if, if I've learned anything from being involved in this industry for a long time, you know, when the, when the acronyms start flying and they, they feel like something out of a comic book, yeah. uh, you, know, they, they, uh, you know, ride the wave, but realize that the undertow will be precipitous. So what, what role uh, and how big a role, I guess is a better question, does passive play in perpetuating this and perhaps it's, it's unraveling? So I think that you've got two aspects of passive. One is that it is, it is an autonomous vehicle. And that's a really important analogy because we're becoming frightened of autonomous vehicles. You could see that with Tesla, you see that with Boeing. We are now becoming suspicious of autonomous vehicles. And, and people really cringe when I call passive you know, index funds autonomous vehicles, but that's what they are. So there's that aspect of it. It's also price indiscriminate. So I think that one of the aspects of this, you have to go then look at 401k flows. So economic driven inflows into passive instruments is keeping all of this going. Um, I don't know how many young people have reached out to me to say, hey, what do you, you know, where do I start with my 401k? Where do I start with my IRA? So there's no question that this full employment is having an impact into flows that are inherently passive because your defined contribution sponsors have all been beaten with a stick to come up with the lowest cost alternatives. So, so I, I'm going to go back to something you spoke about at the beginning because it's been rattling around my head ever since, and that's this, um, this retrenchment on a national level um, from globalization, the, the, the growing cacophony of noise about capitalism not working, um, and then on an individual basis, you know, we as members of society, people retrenching, and whether that's to play PlayStation or into their phones mm -hmm. or whatever it may be, what does all that mean when you take it together for the future? So I think that what, what you're starting to see is a shift in priorities to, from an investing perspective to community-driven investment opportunities, things that are real, that I can see the, the impact tangibly I can walk past it. I can talk to people who are employed there. You know, it's, it's a, buying stocks is a really psychologically distant experience. You know, there's, I can't look at it, and we've, we've made it even more so because you do, you, now you don't even get the stock certificate. Yeah. So, so I have nothing there. So it's, it's, it's very you know, questionable as to what, it, what I've got. So I suspect that the the whipsaw reaction, and we're starting to see this in, in many communities, Detroit being a great example, where folks are saying, if I'm going to invest, I'm going to invest with real impact that I can control, that I can see the consequence of, that I'm proud of. So the, the, the potential outcome is that you see out of this monopolistic, oligopolistic asset management industry, a reversion or a, a migration, not to active. I don't, I don't think active is going to come back in the way we think of it, but to, but to investing that is far more localized. Governments are going to play a big part of that. I, I would be incredibly surprised if you don't see onerous tax rates being put on foreign earnings. So you know, we're going we're gonna to make it very difficult for you to invest in the ETFs that you know, participate in Europe or Asia. You know, it's going to be competitive that way. So what does this mean? Is we now, I mean, it's hard to believe that we're almost three years into the Trump presidency. We're starting to see the, the battle lines being drawn for, for next year, the election, uh, and the battle lines are very clear. And it is capitalism versus some palatable form of socialism, uh, without wishing to label anything, but that seems to be where we're at. What does that debate being front and center for the next election mean? So 
what's so interesting and to me challenging about President Trump in a forecasting perspective is that his his genesis was low confidence. Yeah. He did best where people were feeling worst in 2016. The, the, the state by state, all of the, all of the data really supports that the underconfident migrated towards Trump versus Clinton. That works to become elected, but typically presidential approval rises and falls thereafter with confidence. Yeah. So you have someone who was negatively correlated to mood, now be, who's now become positively correlated to mood. Um, you know, the most interesting, initially I was thinking, you know, because of behavior, was, was Tesla a good proxy for, for Trump? The most clear co- correlation, interestingly, is Las Vegas Sands. His LVS shares and, and Trump approval move in lockstep. And that's interesting, you know, it being a casino, there, there are lots of things within that. But, but what that speaks to is that President Trump has become positively correlated to confidence. So moving into the election, if confidence falls, it begs the question, is he upended because sentiment turns against him. Now, you're never going to upend his base for a whole series of reasons. But the broader question is, if the economy turns down, will he be blamed as most presidents become blamed? He's trying to do a masterful job of laying blame with the Chinese, laying blame with the Fed, laying blame with others. But it's not clear how that will play out in, in November of 2020. But what that also then starts to beg is what does low confidence liberalism look like as far as the candidates that are brought forward? That is not Joe Biden. No. Interestingly, at his genesis in the 1970s, low confidence brought him to the fore, but but he correlates to it's a positive mood. He's a, he's a globalist. He's a, 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 a centrist. There, there are lots of things about him that will make him difficult to serve as a unifying force for the Democratic Party. I think uh, Pete Buttigieg is, a, is an interesting prospect given his grassroots, given his military experience, um, given his location in the heartland. He brings a lot of things behaviorally that would fit in a declining mood. He's, he's also young and youthful, and, and there's, there is a sense that we're, we're going to look for somebody who is charismatic and compelling and youthful. The, the Bernie Sanders of this generation, <laughs> um, Sanders' time has come and gone. He, he no longer has the traction with the youth. So the, the challenge for, for the Democrats is finding a candidate who will be compelling so that you, you unify a growingly or a, a, a crowd that is growing more irritable. Yeah. But what, what does it say to you when you, when we, when we look at Sanders and he had, a, he had a hell of a run and you know, arguably would have won had, had he run against Trump? Um, you, know, you can certainly make that case. We'll never know. But what does it say to you that, that his policies have kind of been taken and kind of built upon by AOC and by Elizabeth Warren? And it seems on the on the Democrat side that there's a there's a one upmanship of taxation and and demonizing the wealthy. I mean, this 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 divide is real, yeah. obviously. Um, so, so how important is that, and how important is the fact that this there seems to be a ratcheting of? of so, I, I think that speaks to the the growing decline in mood. So, so we should expect that if mood continues to fall, the the, the calls will become even more extreme. Uh, and so, you know, higher taxation you know, policies that are, you know, more liberal oriented will will become more and more pronounced that the challenge will be for the Democrats being 
self-aware enough to say, at the end of the day, you've got to find somebody who can at least attempt to straddle some group on the right. But that seems difficult because the right is so far. I mean, you've got to have some pretty yeah. wide legs to get a straddle right. So, So you end up with people having to hold their nose one way or the other. So is there, I mean, look, in, in, in wrapping this up and looking for a, a, a slightly more positive way to finish, is there a way that you can see that this, this decline in confidence can, for want of a better phrase, have a, a, a Goldilocks soft landing and perhaps it kind of dissipates, but we reach somewhere where maybe the trade negotiations get settled and then we have a, a renewed burst of confidence or is this a cycle that that has to run its course and that requires a complete loss of confidence so I'm looking at every low to see what's the what's the sustainability of it and so the December low to me bottomed on chaos more than anything else yep that's not the basis for some sort of a bull market from here. You know, might we make it to new all-time highs? Yes, but, but it's not, it's very different from 2011. It's very different from you know, what, what we've seen certainly in the last 10 years of, of, a, of, a, of a low with real traction. I, I think that policymakers are gonna to have to come pretty close to the edge of the cliff and realize that it is in their and our best interest to, to come to some agreement. That's very difficult given the way we have tribalized and the, the echo chambers that exist. And so it, it deeply troubles me that we're not suggesting true openness to anything that is across the aisle. Um, you know, I think that one thing to watch will be, does infrastructure gain any kind of traction? Because that would, that would be a signal that, okay, beneath all of the rhetoric, beneath all the, the anger, you have some willingness and, and ability to, to come together. But I, I think, Short of that, uh, you know, this this is this is pretty perilous. So you, you know, you have in China a leader who, at the top, was you know, named for life. Yeah, and that that speaks to an extreme in confidence. So I, I always think that you know that which happens at the top needs to be mirrored at the bottom to an equivalent extreme. So is 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 this? Um you know, whenever I try and think this through, it seems to me that the wealth inequality issue <clears throat> is the one thing that if we're going to bottom and we're going to kind of get through this part and into the upside, that has to be dealt with somehow. Because it's, it's the, the longer it, it, it remains in, an, in a, an era of declining confidence, the bigger a target it becomes, the bigger a focal point it becomes for both sides. Does that have to be resolved? And, and is there a way for it to be resolved without some kind of, you know, you and I have spoken about conflict in the past, and we, you know, it, doesn't, it doesn't necessarily have to be a war, but it feels like there has to be a conflict of some sort. Yeah, I, I think that there, there, there will be. I think that the vilification of, of the wealthy uh, is, is inevitable at this point. The, 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 the American dream for, for most Americans has become unachievable. And so that which is not given will be taken. Yeah. And so whether it's taken through taxation, you know, the estate tax to me seems like a very likely way because it's such a, again, psychologically distant yeah. phenomenon and it affects so few. But, you know, both on the left and the right, I, I, I think people have misread the right in terms of its feelings about wealth inequality. You know, a, a, you you keep agricultural prices low the way they are today, and you could see, you know, a lot of middle America joining folks on the left to say, "Where's mine?" I mean, you you have big agra, so, and you know the data suggests they're they're the ones who are getting all of the farm subsidies. So, so the the potential 
unification, I don't think is necessarily ideological left-right. It could be up-down. It could be in any number of ways. I, I, it's sort of the, my frustration with the, the, the stereotyping of, of Trump supporters versus Clinton supporters. The, the Venn diagrams are not, the, the circles are not clean. Yeah. And I think that the wealth inequality piece is gonna be one where you could see very, what would be viewed as very strange bedfellows come together where it surprises the pundits who gains traction in that, in that mode. Yeah, I mean, that doesn't surprise me. Well, wealth is, 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 is politically agnostic, it seems to me. It's, 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 we've had wealthy Democrats, we've got wealthy Republicans, and, and they are clear targets. So, what, so last question, what is the, what's the one story, the one narrative that people should really be paying attention to? Is it the trade wars, or is it something that most people aren't paying attention to over here? I think that, I think this that it's important with the trade wars. The trade wars are a consequence. I, I think people need to stop looking at those and saying trade causes the trade war causes this. It's like no no no, we're causing unconsciously that per, the, the the trade war to either continue or to end. That that is a that's a consequence of of how we're behaving. I, I think the bigger question, Grant, is. Are we reaching a point where things are becoming incredulous? There are a lot of ten-headed ladies out there. And I, I, I'm looking to see, as those start to be exposed, the, the danger is that people say, if that's not real, what is? Yeah. Well, look, I guess we're going to find out, uh, and hopefully you can come back again as this as this continues to kind of unravel or make its way through wherever it's going, and, and we can do this again because it's been so much fun, Peter. I, I, say, I, I love reading everything you write, so thanks for taking the time to come and do this. It's been fantastic. No, great to talk to you again. Thanks. Well, I told you there was a lot to talk about. Um, we talked for an hour. I could have talked for two or three more, and if Peter's got the time, I'm going to take him for a coffee now and have the rest of that conversation. But... Yeah, everything Peter talks about really kind of rings around my head. And I think if you, if you look through that conversation, there are so many ideas to think about, so many potential outcomes to try and handicap. Uh, and for me, that was an invaluable conversation. So I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did.